Hi everyone, I'm Charlene Habermeyer of Good Parenting Brighter Children, and this is Tidbits of Wisdom for Parents. Today I'm going to talk about the power of a story and how important stories are not only to our lives as parents, but also in the lives of your children. <clears throat> so I'm going to start out with a story. This is the story of a young man by the name of Alexander Dolgan. He was an American, his parents were Polish, his father was an engineer, and he actually <clears throat> landed an amazing job in Russia. And so he was over in Russia being, you know, doing engineer work there, and he asked the government he wanted to bring his family over. So his family came over and they were living there. In fact, they lived there, it was supposed to be one year, but it developed into a lot more than one year. And so what they wanted to do is when they, they, it came time that they wanted to come back to the United States, the Russian government wouldn't allow it because they said that they had been in Russia for so long that they were now citizens. But this was the time of the Cold War. And Alexander remembered the United States very well and he wanted to go back. And at this particular time, he was working at the American Embassy. <clears throat> one day he left for lunch and he wasn't seen of or heard again for eight years. The KGB picked him up and they charged him with es espionage and being a spy. And so they interrogated him for the next 18 months, 18 hours a day. He lost 50 pounds, all of his hair fell out. And he, but was the, the amazing thing is he never broke. So they got tired and they figured that, you know, who knows whether he was a spy or not. So they put him into one of the 165 slave labor camps. Now this was during the time of Stalin and they had between 12 and 15 million political prisoners. <clears throat> to give you an idea, in the United States in 1991, in the whole entire um, United States, there was only 1.2 million prisoners. So you can imagine 12 to 15 million prisoners between these 165 labor camps. Alexander said that when, he, when they shoved him basically into the room, <clears throat> that there were these two men that came to him and said, you're wearing our trousers. Now his trousers were in a lot better shape than these other men. And so he knew that in order for him to survive with all of these men in these horrible conditions, that he was gonna have to stick up for himself. So there was a fight that ensued between the three of them. Then all of a sudden, this person yelled out and basically told these two men to back off and to stop. Then this little weasened old man motioned to Alexander to follow him. And Alexander followed him into the middle of this uh, prison room or whatever you want to call it. And there on the top of this bunk bed was the most amazing sight that Alexander had ever seen. There was a man, he was about six feet tall, in fact he was over six feet tall, he was wearing tall leather boots. He was perfectly dressed. He was clean. He was clean shaven. Um, he looked fabulous. And he had this big, long hunting knife. And he was cutting off slices of salami or sausage and putting them in between slices of hot, or white bread and eating it. Alexander was dumbfounded. He hadn't seen meat or bread in 18 months. The man was referred to as the Pakan which basically is like a mafia boss, but not quite. <clears throat> and he said to Alexander, he said, you're an American, aren't you? And Alexander nodded and he said, have you read a lot of novels? Have you seen a lot of movies? To which both of the things that Alexander said, yes. He said, that's what's kept me alive the last 18 months. He says, I've gone over every movie I've ever seen. I've thought about every book that I've ever read. And the, uh, the man said to him, good. He said, we need someone who can tell us stories. He said, can you squeeze a novel, tell a novel? Can you tell us novels, narrate stories? The same with movies. We have no storyteller here, and we need stories. Life is empty without a good story to keep you going every day. Can you do that? <clears throat> Alexander was very excited, and he said absolutely that he could do that. And so the Packin said, good. He says, I will gather, I'll call the brothers around, and we can get started. So for the next eight years, that is what kept Alexander's sanity intact, being able to relate these stories and relate these movies to these other men. It not only kept his sanity intact, but it also kept the other men's sanity intact as well. It wasn't until after the Vietnam War and the psychologists began to debrief the prisoners of war that they came to understand the importance of stories 
the importance of movies, the importance of traditions in a person's home. Because the men who fared the best after having that horrible experience were the ones who could rely on their memories. They could bring forth all of the books that they had read, and they could think about them in every possible detail. They thought about the movies that they had seen. They thought about the wonderful traditions that they experienced as a family. <clears throat> and those were the things that kept them going and that kept them alive. Now, the same thing is with stories when we read them to our children, when we read them to ourselves. Robert Penn Warren, who is a three-time Pulitzer Prize winner, he said, there's reasons why we love fiction. In fact, I think it's pretty much like, <clears throat> I don't know, 75% of people, if they're going to read a book, they're going to read fiction. And I think it's only like 7% that will read a nonfiction book. So here's what Robert Penn Warren said about reading fiction. He says, number one, we like it. He said there's conflict in it, and all of us experience conflict in our lives. He said it allows us to vent our emotions of love and hate and laughter and tears. When we read those stories, we become engrossed with the stories, and we almost become like we're right in the story itself and that we're one of the characters. He said it also, the, we hope that when we read fiction, we hope that it will give us some insights into our own life and into our own problems and the things that we have difficulty with. One of the biggest things, he said, is that it releases us from all the stressors, stresses and pressures in our life. And we escape into it. And there's a lot of escape literature out there that does that very thing. So those are just some of the reasons that we love fiction. Now I want to tell you three short little stories. I, <clears throat> I love reading to my kids. As you know, I read to them from the time they were born until they left at 18 for college. But what I really loved was I loved to read about the authors themselves because it kind of gave me a little insight into how and why they wrote what they wrote and some of the things that they wrote about. <clears throat> and one of them was Rule Dahl. He's the author of James and the Giant Peach, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Matilda, the Twits, and so forth. He's British. <clears throat> when he was three years old, his father died, and his father always wanted him to go to a boarding school. His mother was Norwegian, and so she reluctantly sent him to a boarding school at the age of eight. And he was there for 10 years, and he hated every minute of it. There was just rule after rule after rule, and Ruled was a very creative and imaginative child, and they don't do well with 20 million rules and being punished if you don't keep them. But he said the greatest day of the whole week was on Saturday, on the weekends, because Mrs. O'Connor from the village would come in and she would read to the boys for about two and a half, three hours. He said he was captivated by the stories that she read and he fell in love with books. And as a result, he became an author and a very captivating, imaginative and creative author. Children of all ages love his books. Another one is uh, Robert McCloskey, who wrote Lentil, Make Way for Ducklings, and my favorite, Homer Price. McCloskey was a perfectionist, and so when he wrote about Homer Price, Homer Price actually was Robert McCloskey. He put himself basically in that book. And um, <clears throat> Homer, he played the, the harmonica. Robert McCloskey played the piano, the harmonica, the oboe, and the drums. You know, when he became interested in something, he completely immersed himself. Well, when he was deciding to make <clears throat> or write the book, Make Way for Ducklings, actually it took him an entire year to write that book, and it was a little over 1,400 words. But he was really concerned about the illustrations. He wanted them to be flawless and perfect. And he was talking about mallard ducks. And so he went to the library, he went to the museums, he looked at all different kinds of pictures and stuffed birds and so forth. And then he even went so far as to buy some mallard ducks and he brought them to his Greenwich Village apartment and he watched them waddle around, the little, the little tiny ones, the little babies and the parents, he watched them. And when they, their movements started getting too fast, then he fed them some wine so that they would slow down so that he could get everything flawless and perfect. Those of you who have read his books, you know, it's one thing about falling in love with what he's saying, but I love his illustrations as well. The last one has a lot of meaning to me. It's Wilson Rawls who wrote Where the Red Fern Grows and Summer of the Monkeys and several others. He was born in Oklahoma and raised there in a very, very poor family. <clears throat> he had very little schooling, 
but he loved dogs. And he had this incredible story about a young boy and his two hound dogs. Now, when he got married to his wife, he had actually written the whole entire book, but he was ashamed and he didn't want his, his wife to see that his grammar and his English were bad, and so he burned it. Well, later into their marriage, he told her about the book that he had written, and she was horrified that he had destroyed it, and so she told him, she said, you must rewrite it. So he got to work, and within three weeks, he had rewritten the entire thing. Now, those of you who have read Where the Red Fern Grows, or your children have read it, or you've read it as a family, or they've heard their teachers read it to them in school, it's classic. It is the most amazing story. But here's where it gets interesting for me. When I was in the fifth grade at Garfield Elementary School, Wilson Rawls came to our school to talk. It made such a huge impression on me. I remember where I was sitting, all of the children, we were sitting on the floor in the auditorium, the wood floor. I remember what I was wearing. I remember him. He was very tall. He talked with a southern drawl, and you could tell that he loved to write and that he loved um, where the red fern grows. And he talked to us about the book, and he talked to us about how he went about writing it. He died in 1984. I don't remember when Summer of the Monkeys came out, but that was another book that I read to my kids. And then we tried to um, ask ourselves, okay, which one is our favorite of Wilson Rawls? Is it Summer of the Monkeys or is that Where the Red Fern Grows? And I had to tell you, it was a toss-up. They're both amazing, amazing books. So here's what I would like to tell you. <clears throat> When you read all those incredible stories, and particularly as your kids get older, you're going to want to read chapter books to them. <clears throat> Find out a little bit about the author. It will give you some insight into what they read. And continue reading those fiction books because your children will love those stories. They will relate to them and they will learn from them. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you tomorrow.